Um, so this story that I'm going to tell you starts out uh, when I'm about your age. Um, I was a junior in high school. We, I went to a high school. We had one counselor, so the amount of time that I got with my counselor was, um, was kind of minimal. I know you guys have like 15 counselors uh, in your schools, um, but we only had one counselor. And, and so you know, near the end of your junior year, the question everybody's asking is, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? What do you want to be when you grow up? And you know, maybe a few of you, when you popped out of the womb, you're like, I want to be a fireman, right? Um, but for most of us, when we're 22 or 17, um, we have no clue what we really want to do. And so I ran into my counselor's office. It was kind of like waterboarding. I laid on the table. He started pouring water. What do you want to be? What do you want to be? And I was like, I don't know what I want to be with, uh, when I grow up. Well, you're good at math and science. You should be an engineer. I'm like, great, I'll be an engineer. And I run out, and I cling to that, right? And obviously, there's no waterboarding in my school. But, uh, but the experience feels like that often when you're in high school. There's a lot of pressure to figure out exactly what do you want to do. And they're big decisions. It's going to change or uh, uh, dictate the course of your life. And so um, while we're trying to get good grades and hold on to a narrative of uh, I want access to the best schools, often this idea of what my passions are, what my gifts are, um, are lost. Uh, in the high school experience. So five years into uh, uh, Drexel University as an engineering student, my last co-op, I realized uh, I don't think I want to be an engineer for the rest of my life. Um, and there's a whole nother story, but I, I figured out that I really was interested in becoming an educator, not just uh, uh, an educator, but my passion um, had to do with urban education. And so I became an, an urban uh, math and science teacher. I started teaching at West Philadelphia High School, which is, was back then and still is one of the most challenging schools in Philadelphia. And um, it was really scary. Like my first year there was really, really difficult. <clears throat> and so to try to make sense of what was going on, I started an after school program. Um, I would like to say that I had the vision for what was going to happen, but I didn't. I was, I was uh, considered a good teacher. My kids were you know, sitting in desks in rows, and you know, there wasn't any fist fights going on in my classroom, so I must have been doing something right. And, uh, and I was not satisfied with the type of learning that was going on. And so to preserve my own mental health, I started this after-school program. We happened to have a go-kart uh, in the shop. Uh, there was an automotive shop right adjacent to my classroom, and I got friendly with the shop teachers. And my students decided, Let's, uh, let's turn it into an electric go-kart and make a science fair project out of it. Let me see if I got this. And, uh, and so they went to the science fair, and they got second place. And kids from West Philly High School don't get second place in science fairs. That was really cool back then. Um, and it got them really excited. And they said, let's do something bigger. Uh, and so the following year, they, we had this Jeep in the shop that was just sitting there. They converted it to electric power. This was way before electric cars were cool, um, or even people we're really talking about them. Uh, and so they took that to the science fair, and they won the Philadelphia Science Fair, and they went on to the state, uh, the regional science fair. And, and they, they were just blown away by the experience, and they wanted to do something bigger. So we looked around, and I found a competition called the Tour de Sol. It was a five-day road race from New York City to Washington, DC. And uh, it was for alternative power vehicles. So mostly electrics and solars then. There was a couple of hybrids. Uh, the, the hybrid idea was brand new at this time. This is uh, 14 years, 15 years ago. And, um, and so we enter the race. And the first year, we made it through. The second year, we did a little bit better. And by the third year, um, the unexpected happened. Uh, the car that you can kind of see behind us is a Saturn that we converted to all electric power. Um, we got over 180 miles per gallon. There was 41 teams from around the country, and uh, we ended up winning the race. Um, uh, I can still remember the last day MIT was in the judging tent saying, it's, in, it's mathematically impossible. They can't beat us. And the judges are like, well, here are the scores. This is what their fuel economy is. Um, and two things happened there. Uh, it feels really good if you're from a low-budget high school and you beat MIT. I guess three things. It felt really good. Um, the other thing that happened was, as a teacher, I started to realize that my students were learning more 
through this after school experience than in my classes. Um, and the types of things they were learning were really important. Not only were they learning to solve engineering problems, but they were learning to become experts in something that they were interested in. They were being put in a place where people were coming to them to ask them about um, electric cars and what they meant. The other thing that happened which was really interesting was that uh, at that time, Toyota rolled out the Prius. The Prius is brand new in 2002. They used the Toyota Soul as one of their uh, test marketing uh, platforms and to see what the public response would be. And so I'm working with inner city high school kids and they get to see the Prius uh, really early on and they said, Mr. Hogger, hybrid cars are the next thing, but something's gotta change if they're gonna catch on. So high school students got this. GM at the time is saying, no, hybrids are never gonna work. Um, and they're, they're winding down their electric vehicle program. The Japanese had ramped them up and uh, gotten there first. And so kids from West Philly said, um, if they're gonna catch on, something needs to change. And so I challenged them to solve that problem. And so it takes teenagers to kind of think outside the box. You guys actually kind of live outside the box, right? Uh, um, and they came up with this idea, we need to make a badass hybrid. Now badass and hybrid uh, don't usually find themselves in the same sense, but uh, when teenagers are challenged to solve real problems, you guys come up with really creative ideas. And so this was uh, the vehicle that we built next. Um, we designed it to break a stereotype of what hybrids could be. This is back in 2003. We designed it, it took us a couple years to raise the money and to build it. In 2005, we go back to the Tortoise Soul. Um, we won the race again. And now the fact that we had a cool looking car and there's urban kids and we won the race, uh, we started to get national media attention. And all this time as a teacher, I'm thinking about how can I do more of this kind of stuff in my classroom? Um, they painted the car, took it back the next year, won again, and this put us in position for the next big competition that was being announced in 2008. The X Prize, um, which had just finished the Ansari X Prize, the whole Space X program came out of it, announced its second competition was to make cars that get over 100 miles per gallon um, that are cost effective. And we threw our hat in the ring. 111 teams from around the world, and uh, we were the only high school. So over the next two years, we were competing against big corporations, MIT again, um, Cornell, several top universities. And for the next two years, uh, we raised money, built cars. This was one of the cars we built. And um, found ourselves uh, at Michigan International Speedway in the semifinals. Um, and it was an incredible journey for the students and the staff that were a part of that. Now, uh, for the sake of time, I'll, uh, I'll not give you a spoiler. Um, if you want to see how that competition end, ended, you can go to Frontline. They did a documentary on us and followed us. And uh, I happen to think it's a pretty good documentary, but um, I'm not objective about it. So you can check it out at some point. So um, one of my favorite quotes from the documentary is one of my students saying, you can't teach critical thinking without critical conditions, right? What does it mean to develop critical thinking skills? And, and I agree with the last speaker, there's a whole bunch more than to education than just critical thinking. Um, but this is a really powerful thought, and I want you to hold this thought because this is where I think my story and your story uh, come back together. And I want you to just think for one second uh, about this question I'm gonna ask and then I'm gonna see if I can predict your answer, all right? This is the kind of magic part of the presentation. So, um, think about a highlight from high school so far, something that you're gonna remember when you leave high school. Just take a moment, think of one of the highlights from high school, and I'm gonna see if I can predict it, all right? Has everybody got their highlight? All right, did I get it right? Oh, this is LM, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. Uh, and uh, the LM school district, uh, maybe this was it, no? I, and trust me, I'm an I'm engineer by nature. I love teaching math and science. I love the quadratic equation, I geek out on it. And um, often it's taught outside of context. It, it like, and this isn't the quadratic equation, you guys have to memorize how to derive the quadratic equation because that's really important, you know. Um, uh, sorry for the sarcasm, but, um, um, 
so much of education has become just memorizing facts. So that, why? Why, why are you told that you need to, to know all of this stuff? So that you can get good grades, so that you can get into a top tier college, so that you can get into a top tier graduate school program, so that you can get the job that you want, because that's gonna make you happy or successful. And I contend there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, and so it begs the question, what's the purpose of school? Is it to know how many ATP are created from cellular respiration? Anybody know? I thought it was 38, damn. Um, and I've become a principal, so I've somehow made it not knowing the right answer to that. Uh, the, the, the amount of information and the depth that you go in, I contend, is not what the purpose of school is. Math and reading and writing and philosophy, being able to debate, to cite evidence and have reasoning, all of those things are crucial. But they're crucial to do something with it, not just to do more education. They're crucial to be able to find what you're passionate about and what your gifts are. They're crucial so that you can have a sense of who you are and what makes you tick. There's nothing worse than getting to the end of the line and getting that job and finding out that you're miserable. That this is, you know, the, the, the paycheck is not making you happy. And it won't. Um, and so I contend that the purpose of school is something bigger than what often is taught in school. And, when, and ask yourself, think about the skills that you need to be successful. You're all smart young folks. It's not the quadratic formula. It might be what you do with that information. But when you read any research that's out there now, Tony Wagner, deeper learning competencies, I'm, the list goes on and on and on. What are some of the skills that you need to be successful? What's the big one that's really popular right now because the professors at University of Penn? Anybody know? It rhymes with mitt. Grit, right? You need grit. Um, so, and that's, what do you do when you face a challenge? How do you persevere? How do you move through it? It's a very important skill to develop. How do you develop grit? By memorizing quadratic formula and how it's derived? Or by taking on real problems and real challenges um, and really struggling through things that are important to you? Obviously, I, I would suggest this the latter. So, what did I do? Well, I became more and more disillusioned, I don't know if you can tell, uh, with the way education was working, and uh, a few colleagues and I started a school in Philadelphia. Now, it's easier to design cars that get over 180 miles per gallon than to get a school started in Philadelphia. So I'm kind of shortcutting that part of the story. It was very difficult to get the school started. But the idea behind the school is why can't the curriculum be about solving real problems? We trust students to take on real problems and develop real projects and responses to things that are important to them and to society. Is it messy? Yes. Do we get to have a nice linear progression of all the facts that you need to know to call it algebra one or biology? No, we don't. But when students learn the things that they're learning through that process, the skills, the academic skills, they go deep and they really understand them and they use them for a purpose. And they develop these other skills the skills we think that adults use every day to be successful. And so, here's a couple of pictures of different types of projects. We have shop space, kids learn how to use all sorts of cool tools to make stuff. Um, in this example, students were doing an experiment with green roofs, so it was a science experiment. They set up a, a little model green roof, took data, learned about all the benefits of um, what green roofs can and can't do. Uh, a local business approached us last year. Anybody ever have a little baby's ice cream? Um, uh, they approached us and they wanted to launch their ice cream into space. We said, sure, what the hell, that sounds like fun, and collected data as we actually took it to near space and then tracked it, and that was a great project. Um, and it was allowed the students to interface. Uh, often uh, businesses or companies will come to us with fun projects like this or more serious projects. It gives the students an, an opportunity to interface with people outside the school. Students start businesses. Uh, this is workshop industries where uh, two years ago a kid came up with the idea of, around Christmas time that he wanted to make an ornament with the word John for the Christmas tree, the little ones hanging up in the back, and he called it a Johnament, and it caught on. <laughs> and, uh, 
every year we sell out. And this year we took, made a big one and took it down and the, the new mayor had, hung it around his neck. We put it on the Rocky statue. Um, but that's a student run business that the, the students created. Our kids give speeches on topics that are important. And often it's to peers or the public, but sometimes really important people show up to those speeches. Um, and I think that, that teenagers should be put in that position. Your ideas matter. You guys have a lot to, to add to the conversations that are going on. And school should be about giving you opportunity to insert yourself into those conversations. Um, and it's about building a community so students feel cared for and respected and valued. And often these projects end up going out into the world and accomplishing things we didn't realize they were going to in the beginning. Um, and uh, one of the marvelous ones that, as my son said, uh, two years ago, we ended up landing at the White House, which was a really, really interesting experience. Um, and an amazing, an amazing thing for the students to participate in. So when you guys are given opportunity, um, you can do wonderful things. And I want to leave you with two thoughts. The first is, I challenge you to demand more from your school and your education. Think about what are the things that you're passionate about and challenge your teachers and your administrators here to give you space to work on those things in the, con in the confines of the school day. The cool stuff shouldn't be all after school. And you are incredibly blessed and I'm very blessed to have my son in this district because you have an enormous amount of resources and you can do a lot of cool things after school like this program, right? Planning this program happened after school. Um, the robotics team, the, I mean, the myriad of clubs that, that you have access to. And that's often where you're finding your passions. But shouldn't that be more in the school day? Shouldn't you have opportunity to work on real things as a part of the curriculum? So I would challenge you to demand more. And the second thing is, as you think about what, what you want to do and what really makes you tick, don't worry about, your mom's going to be really pissed off I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say it. Don't worry about the number of AP classes you take. Think about the, the classes that interest you and think about the things you can do to start to connect with what your passion is. I've found my passion and I'm extremely grateful that I have and I hope you guys find yours. Thank you.